Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to the episode of Spitting Venom, aka the Venom Vlog. And today we have more San Diego Comic-Con coverage, this time from MTV, who sat down with Ruben Fleischer and Riz Ahmed to do this interview. And we're just gonna talk about some of the highlights, but if you wanna watch the full interview, definitely check it out down below. Uh, so real quick, let's just dive into it because there's a few things here that weren't mentioned at the panel. Uh, but a lot of it was just reiteration of stuff that was mentioned at the panel. So we will just try to go through real quickly. Uh, the main thing I want to talk about is what Ruben Fleischer says near the beginning of this interview, where he talks about uh, what story to write when it comes to Venom. And what they landed on was Lethal Protector. And they said, you know, we had to choose a lane. We had to pick where, like, what's our foundation. And so they went with Lethal Protector because to them, this had a story in it that was very much an Eddie Brock story. Even though Spider-Man is a big part of it, He's really just there to find out more information about Eddie Brock, and he's like going and inter you know talking to Eddie Brock's dad and the maid and all this stuff, and then he eventually gets into the battle with Venom at the end of it, and then sides with Venom and chooses to you know be partners with Venom in the final battle, and that's really the only thing Spider-Man does. Uh, so when they looked at the story itself, they were like, wow, it's Eddie Brock. He's in San Francisco. He's coming back home after like a fail, you know, type of failure in a way where he went to New York, did his life over there, that didn't go so well, he made a deal with Spider-Man to leave. So they looked at the roots of that and they were like, all right, it's a guy who's coming back home and he's kind of down on his luck and he's trying to rebuild himself. And that's kind of the journey they wanted to go on and one that kind of mirrors a little bit of what happened in Lethal Protector. And it has Eddie getting involved with, you know, the homeless people and people down on their luck and trying to become a champion of theirs in a way, uh, but standing up for the little guy, and, uh, you know, as well as himself in a lot of ways too. So when they looked at that, they thought, well, that's a good growth for the character. And then he gets involved with the Life Foundation and there's a good enemy there and there's something that they could work with. So then the, the rewrites happened and they were like, all right, we can actually work with this. And so he talked about that from the scripting pages. And then obviously he talked about the obvious challenges of not being able to use Spider-Man and other things. But he, he said what it did to them was it thought, you know, it had them work more creatively and how they could possibly even do this. Because, you know, the one question they asked themselves was the same thing a lot of fans asked, which is how do you do this without Spider-Man? How do you tell Venom's story without Spider-Man? And, uh, and still make it at the heart true to the character from a tonal standpoint and a character standpoint. And we've talked about that ever since the beginning of this show. I've had my theories on that, how all you really need to tell Eddie Brock's story is you need someone to ruin his life and you need the symbiote to hate the same person that, that ruined Eddie Brock's life. And then that puts them on a path to you know their adventure. And that to me is all you really need for a Venom story. Uh, they didn't go into so many words about that here, but they do talk about how they had to strip away a lot of stuff, but get to the core of the character in order to tell his story. So that makes me feel good that they're, again, I said this in the last video, how much thought is being put into this and that Ruben Fleischer really wanted to capture the tone of Venom and that balance between dark, you know, darkness and humor and real, you know, serious issues, uh, and then also comic book kind of stuff as well. So uh, hearing that really made me feel good. Um, and then he also said that Riz, working with Riz was great because Riz had a really good perspective, a little, a really great take on Carlton Drake. After reading the script, he ex extrapolated a lot of things that he applied and was like, hey, well, what if we did this? And I think this is a great motivation. And to see them put that much into this uh, just shows you that it is worth at least being optimistic over. I know some people aren't going to be and they're going to hate it no matter what. And that's totally fine. I mean, any, everyone's reason for whatever is fine with me. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, but for me, at least as someone who was kind of not on board with this before I started the show, as we got like 10 or 12 episodes into the show, I realized, wow, this could actually work if you just focus on the character. And it sounds like that's what they're doing, even with Riz's character, Carlton Drake. Um, so, uh, you know, then they asked him, like, is there anything in the film you would change from what you have so far? And he says, you know, I wouldn't. Obviously, we had our limitations. In a perfect world, Spider-Man would be there and all this other stuff. But from what we did and how hard we worked on what we came up with, he's like, I don't know if I would change a thing. And that's why I hope people like it is because I think this is a really good take on the Venom character that's true to him, um, you know, minus some of the visual aspects, obviously the spider and everything, we'll talk about that in the next episode, because, but minus some of the obvious things, I think we still were really true to this character in this universe uh, without, you know, the things that fans would really like to be a part of it. And uh, and he goes, so I just hope people give it a chance for that reason and see that we really did work hard and we thought it, it added an obstacle, like, all right, how do we do this without Spider-Man, without all these other connections? And, uh, and it was interesting to hear him talk about that you know and then how and see all obviously how human he is he's like you know a lot of times people are like oh this director this this director that we, we understand that they're human beings obviously uh, but people are so callous with their insults and stuff and they just sling them around without any really concern or any, you know care at all and for me I'm like well this
this guy. He made Zombieland, which I really liked, and it sounds like he's putting a lot of thought into this movie. And I hope it pays off. You know, I hope I end up liking the movie. I'm still, I'm optimistic, but I'm still like, eh, it could still be bad. Uh, but hearing all this, you know, makes me feel a little bit good about being optimistic at least. Um, and then he said, due to the trailer's views and stuff, you know, it makes him feel a little bit, you know, more reassured that they're on the right path. And but he does acknowledge that he has a big responsibility telling this story as as well as he can, knowing the limitations and knowing what people want to see. And he realizes that it, there's a lot of weight on his shoulders and he's trying his best, you know, to to do, you know, the best job he can. And he, and he hopes that people like it. And he does mention also that there is a lot of groundwork in this movie for potential future films. And uh, and that really got, you know, people at the con excited. A lot of interviewers asked that in other interviews too, even the next video we'll talk about. Uh, but the fact that there are seeds in this, as they put it, for future films. You know, they still made a one and done movie, but there's enough there to build upon uh, if they choose to go that route and if this movie is a success. And then Riz did add some stuff. He talked about how, you know, no villain sees himself as the villain, you know, which is an old phrase that was slung around Hollywood for many years and writers use it in comic books and stuff. So it's good to, you know, have that with the villain where they'll do really horrible things, but to them it's like, oh, it's not that bad because my intentions are well and the end result is what I think we all need and it's better for, you know, human humankind and stuff. And so he talks about how, um, a character who's given a god's eye view uh, doesn't get caught up in you know in individual lives anymore, and that's what he says is ultimately what people will perceive as the bad thing inside Carlton Drake is that a, a person's life, one single person's life, doesn't matter to him anymore because he sees the big picture. Um, and, you know, it's it and they, that phrase the god's eye view is really interesting because it obviously goes back to literature and writing and things and also dissecting characters where um, you know and in the belief that you know God is so busy with something big and you know the the cosmic you know uh, landscape and portrait of the whole universe that an individual life isn't at the top of his list um, because that there's a, a a plan for everything right and that's like the the conception of God a lot of people have and that. That's what he says with Carlton Drake. Carlton Drake has ascended in a way uh, mentally uh, past, you know, you know, the normal human, I guess. He, he runs his own business. He's with all these experiments. He discovers life on another planet, apparently, you know, if we're to believe the things he hinted at in the last panel uh, with him in search of something out in space and finding the symbiotes. So he, he puts himself above everyone. And because of that, he finds himself in a position or puts himself in a position where he thinks he knows what's best for mankind. And with that comes the the neglect of individual lives and how he'll experiment on somebody or sacrifice somebody for the greater good in a way and so it was interesting to hear him talk about it in that way i thought that was very interesting and again showing how much thought is really put into these characters and in this movie um and then he also you know basically called to drake's goal is to secure the future for all of humanity at whatever cost uh, so that was really cool and he said his ethics collide with mainstream ethics that was the what he the phrase he summed up Carlton Drake is Carlton Drake's ethics just collide with mainstream ethics and uh, and so that's that was kind of his point of view there which I thought was cool and he also says that he's known Tom Hardy for years which I didn't know this uh, Riz Ahmed has made music before which I did know that but I didn't know Tom Hardy was in one of his music videos so I'll try to link it down below it's called uh, Sour Times is the name of the song it came out in 2009 and he goes by Riz MC uh, so it's more like uh, word poetry uh, but with some music over it and stuff, but it, it's pretty interesting stuff. So I'll put a link down there for those of you out there who want to check it out. Uh, and then he talks about how Tom's dedicated to the role, how he's kind of the right kind of crazy, and how he gets really into a role, but not at the detriment of ruining the film. He wants the film to be great, and he wants the the, the character to feel human, uh, but he does, you know, push that line sometimes and has fun with it. And so Riz kind of described him as crazy in all the right ways. Um, and then he and Riz also went on to mention Jenny Slate, and he said that she plays the lead scientist for the life foundation and that she brings a lot of humanity to that role and a lot of you know sympathy uh, to the cause uh, that's going on and uh, and has a really great reason for being there as a character but he also said she's really known for comedic roles but what she brings to this role is a lot of gravitas and he talks about how he really enjoyed the scenes he worked with uh, with her which is great because all the press stuff they've done we haven't really seen Jenny Slate be a part of any of it we saw Michelle Williams now Riz Ahmed and Tom Hardy obviously and Ruben Fleischer but we and and some of the producers Matt 
Matt Tomac and some of those guys are out there doing interviews, but we haven't seen a lot from Jenny Slate, so uh, hopefully we do at some point uh, because I think she's a great actress and I'm really curious as to what role she plays because a lot of, I think her name is Dora Skirth is what people leaked out there. If that's true or not, we don't know. It could be a code name. A lot of people want her to play Dr. Ashley Kafka. I personally would like that too. I would like to see Ashley Kafka in this movie and in this role as a fan of the 90s animated series, uh, but we'll see. You know, we'll see what happens with that. Um, and then they end the interview with talking about Zombieland 2, so we won't get into that. But if you want to check that out, please do. And yes, I am reading from my journal again. I love doing that. Uh, I write everything down, uh, Tom Hardy, Eddie Brock style, um, just to keep in tone with what we're doing here on the show. I just thought it was like a little fun thing. But also, I don't like to have a computer screen in front of me because it'll like brighten me up too much. I've noticed in past videos. So I thought having the paper was, you know, would work as well. So anyway, all of this information, let me know what you think of down below. We still have more stuff to cover. So we'll do that in the next episode. We're going to talk about the IGN interview and the ABC 10 interview and a couple other clips that came out online with some other information about this film. So let me know all your thoughts down below. Thanks so much for watching my show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and we'll see you in the future. Peace.